Our speaker is Alisa Amor Gibbons. She's an architecture, a multidisciplinary designer of environmental conscious, energy efficient and resilient architecture that reflects a deep reverence for our nature and our interconnectedness with the world in which we live. She designs with the belief that our, in our pursuit of one of the most basic human rights, the right to shelter, it is our role as designers to do so while sleeping lightly, while stepping lightly, sorry, as and as respectfully across our physical and cultural landscape as we can. She's a lead accredited professional in the building and des building design and construction, sorry, a lead AP for homes and a well AP, which reflects her passion for architecture that adopts a human centric approach and that promotes wellness. With a master's of engineering in structural engineering, her combined background and specialization in BIM has fostered a passion for delivering architecture that is in constant pursuit of next level intelligence and optimization through synergistic design, architecture that is not only beautiful, but architecture that performs. So welcome, Alisa, I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you to Island City Lab and to CASA for having me. It's an honor to be given the opportunity to talk to you guys. Um, and I think I will just jump right into it. So as Bonita mentioned, my name is Alyssa Amor. I'm from Barbados. And for the past eight or so years, I've been working predominantly in development offices um, as an architectural designer. I have a very deep passion for sustainable design, especially given the climate that we're living in, um, this burgeoning climate crisis that we're living through. I really do believe that as designers is our role to kind of champion not just sustainable design, but resilient design as well. I've done a lot of educational development in terms of sustainability, um, having my lead accreditations in building design and construction, homes, and also well AP, which is the kind of wellness, more human centric aspect of architecture. And I'm also building information management specialists. So I really believe that the key to unlocking some of the solutions that will serve us um, particularly in small island developing states, is to get out of prescriptive architecture and dive into performative architecture, architecture that we can validate its performance. So that's the boring part about me. Um, I like to call architecture my side hustle because nine times out of 10, I'd rather be underwater or outside somewhere. Um, I spend a lot of time in nature, underwater, and kind of seeing the drastic changes that something as simple as our coral reef beds have had to undergo given climate change is really, like I said, a passion of mine to just do everything that we can to kind of approach design from a more synergistic, holistic point of view. So I wanted to start this talk by speaking a little bit about my early interest in architecture. As I said, my kind of journey through architectural education was a little different than one might expect. I actually went straight from high school into university to do an integrated master's course. And I majored essentially in structural engineering. So whatever time I had left after doing that degree is when I would do my architectural education. So I kind of did both at the same time. And I remember the first kind of moment where I fell in love with architecture was when I saw the Petra in Jordan. And that's what I wrote my entrance essay, essay on actually. So, this love of multidisciplinary design, um, this reference to these master builders that always pull from these different themes of philosophy, art, poetry, theology, and kind of integrated that as a holistic discipline into architecture is what really drove my early pursuits and interests. And being that for my first year of schooling, I did no architectural design at all. It was all humanities based. That is kind of where my sense of exploration came from. And quick funny story, when I did my first essay, I did it on a Kemetic temple in Egypt. And I remember the, the professor, she called me into her office and she gave me my grade and it was the top grade for the, the entire um, cohort. And she said to me, you know, where are you from? And I said Barbados. And she said, she had an issue with my essay because it felt like it wasn't written by me after seeing me. And I, you know, I was like, what do you mean? She said, well, the English is, is too good. And I said, you know, I, I would hope so because it's the first language that I speak. But very early on, there was always this kind of 
backlash against trying to go down a certain viewpoint in architecture that I came across. And it was always almost as though I was being asked to, you know, pull back on the research, pull back on the exploration, do everything that's pragmatic, maybe stuff that's been done before, um, fit within the scope of what the curriculum is. And that was never, ever me. Coming from this dual background, I always found the sweet spots in design at those kind of intersections between different disciplines. And that's something that I've taken with me throughout my entire career. So some of my early work in school was always considered to be quite whimsical, um, characterful. Um, people often ask, but is it a building though? And for me, it was always about exploring the themes, the motifs. This first project was, um, was an oral storytelling center, basically in a kind of excluded tongue in, in England, obviously, where I was studying. And we kind of had to take inspiration from a book, any book. And all of the books I were reading at the time were obviously centered on um, astronomy or several different disciplines. So I would kind of go into the toy stores and buy like cheap toys and kind of dissect them and use them as interpretive models. And it was always coming from left field, always quirky, never on the nose, just exploring even like Heath Robinson as gadgets and perpetual motion devices and seeing is there anything in this field that can start to inform what architecture could be from my point of view. And I think because I'm speaking to students is why I wanted to show you kind of this early work. But I think what I've been learning so far in my career is that yes, architecture is a discipline that kind of sits at the crossroads between art and science. But I found that it's super important to hold on to those things that kind of uncover your passion for the artistic and creative side of it, the explorative side of it. Um, it's quite easy to make a building that stands up, but how do you feel? What's the experience that you want people to go through when they step inside these spaces? Yeah, and this is just an example of some of the um, fun little gadgets that I used to make and um, these drawings that I would do. You'd not very often get plans from me. It'll always be some crazy device or just exploring um, more of the emotion of the building. So imagine going from that straight out of school, looking for a job, finding a job with a development office, and then pretty much being put on a plane and sent to site, and you kind of have to figure it out. So kind of my first job outside of the region, sorry, outside of Barbados was in St. Kitts. So Park Hyatt St. Kitts is a development property by um, Arcadia Solutions. And at the time, like I said, it was very early in my career. I was kind of given probably a week or two notice that I had to kind of go over to this, this island, new island for me, and pretty much get to work. Um, the project was about, I want to say about two years over schedule, a lot of money over budget. And the company that I was working for at the time was contracted to come in and basically do value engineering. So to kind of hit the ground running, identify gaps in the design, um, gaps in the construction documentation, be on site, finish material specifications, and pretty much get the project over the line. So those three circles there were the three initial buildings that I was kind of handed. And I had to kind of do all of the construction documentation, as built documentation, all of the coordination, um, whatever value engineering solutions needed to be done, that was kind of just put on me um, when I arrived. And Jordan, if you could share the video. So this is just a progress shot of the site. Um, it's in Banana Bay with views across to the island Island Nation Nevis. And you can see there some of the blocks, the big surrounding pool bars. And in the background, you can see the great house, um, some of the amenity spaces, spa buildings. But this eventually beautiful kind of sweeping resort intervention along the coast. The presidential villa that you see with the pool there at the end probably goes for about 10,000 US per night. Um, so it ended up being a very high end, high end resort development in the end. 
So this was kind of my first, you know, just get out there, figure it out as you go, um, deep dive into what I thought at the time architecture was gonna be. And as I said to you, when I arrived, the initial concepts were about 75 to 80% completed. So there was a huge gap in terms of the vision of the designs, but then the actual drawings, the technical um, details to kind of support that. So a lot of my work was spent doing drawings such as the ones you see at the top, just quick, um, quick elevation sections, um, detailed drawings, just to get information out to site to help push the project over the finish line. A big challenge on the site in particular um, is that obviously on larger projects, you have a lot of different players involved. In this project, for example, there are probably in excess of three to four architects. Some were specifically responsible for the um, concept stages, the general arrangement drawings. Some were then um, responsible for um, kind of interior design. We had some East Asian contractors that did all the interior drawings and all of the fit outs. So when you have such a big project, as I've come to learn, and even on smaller ones, the biggest challenge I find that I faced in my career is communication and coordination. There are often things that are missed um, through, you know, gaping holes in contracts and, and just oversight. But this is such a simple building that you're looking at here, very simple drawing, nothing, you know, earth shattering. But here we have buildings that are designed, but they don't have any any provisions for electrical, no lighting, um, oftentimes no plumbing, oftentimes no coordination of um, fire safety devices. So then I have to come in and quickly think of, okay, how do I integrate these services now without ruining or spoiling um, you know, the beauty and the reserved nature of the architecture. So I spent a lot of time doing really simple detailed drawings, hand drawing and pinpointing each and every light fixture, where it goes, literally where to run the conduit on the underside of the beam, telling guys where they need to chase the beam and fix a fascia to it to hide these elements in order to preserve the original architecture. Something as simple as that roped balustrade, you know, you sit down as a team, you decide, okay, how can we, how can we provide a railing solution that doesn't take away from the lightness of the architecture? Where do we go to find the, the screws to make this happen? Where do we buy the rope? All of that kind of nitty-gritty detail is so simple, but it's something that someone has to sit down and think about. And here you have a typical um, finishes schedule for a large um, master plan like this. And I remember thinking when I first came across these documents and then having to value engineer them, that it didn't seem like a lot of finishes for such a big resort. Um, Obviously, there's some more stuff that went into this, but a lot of my time was spent kind of going over specifications, finding um, more cost effective but good quality um, alternatives, going through all the spec documentation, um, coming up with new ideas or alternatives where it was either over budget or it just came and it was not of good enough quality and just a lot of back and forth with the interior design team and the other architects on the team to kind of find the right solution for each and every single finish across the site. But it's worth it because um, you got to be a part of something that is beautiful. I think as you start your careers, you know, there's always that gap in time between you're doing drawings, um, but then where's the actual built project? You know, it's, it's sometimes it's long going or long in coming to be able to get to that point. But when you do get the opportunities to even be on site or site visits, it's important to just be a sponge basically. Learn as much as you can, walk around, ask questions. I'm pretty sure I see someone in the chat um, who was on site with me. Um, they could probably attest, I could be a bit of a pest when it comes to asking questions and just, sticking my mouth in and figuring out what are we doing guys is this right hi choice? Alyssa hi hi this is Jacynthia hi Jacynthia <laughs> yes I, I just decided to chime in um have been reminiscing on when we worked together in St. Kitts so just saying hi <laughs> hi Jacynthia you see guys we just jump right in and ask questions or you know raise your hand <laughs> I want to kind of show you an example of what we did on site. So 
I don't know if you guys are familiar, but on quite a few large scale projects or in the Caribbean, there's a lot of hotel development going on. What often happens is that you create a mock-up room in a factory somewhere in Vietnam or China, and you create one room that is pretty much perfect. Um, someone flies over, they sign off on all the finishes, each and every element, and then they mass produce the items to be able to ship back to whichever um, country. So that's what we did for this project. So in the images here, you'll see a mock-up. And we can probably maybe like one or two ideas in the chat. Someone can say what they think is the problem here because there are several problems. Um, think about um, durability. Think about um, maintenance that someone needs to do once these rooms are commissioned. Can anybody spot at least one issue that they think would have been flagged by myself or someone else on the design team? having received these images from the manufacturers themselves. Okay, is the entry narrow? I'm assuming you mean on the bottom photo, potentially. What about- okay. The only thing that I see that's missing, I don't see any um, faucets for the plumbing. Yeah, bam, yeah, a big one, right? <laughs> yeah, so imagine if you sign off on this room and there are no faucets included, so that doesn't get put onto anyone's schedule. And then, you know, a couple months down the road, you're ready to open the hotel, but there are no faucets to be included. So something so simple is something that often gets missed. So a lot of my job on that project was kind of sitting over drawings and picking it apart. So this is an example of kind of the red line drawings that you typically see in a project such as this, where someone literally has to go through painstakingly each and every detail and pick it apart to make sure it's correct. Even something as simple as those big X's you see on the big mirrors there, you have to think practically. Imagine as a hotel owner that one of those breaks, because it's quite big, you know, one of it break, one of those breaks, and then you have to order in or, or kind of find a different solution. And imagine if one of those breaks in every room because it's just a bit more fragile. So then you kind of go through that exercise and now you have faucets and now you have a simpler mirror solution, just a simple proprietary makeup mirror that it may not be as, as luxurious, but is more fit for purpose. So that was Park Hayat. Um, and then I wanna talk to you a little bit more about designing with purpose. Um, this project is probably one of my favorite projects that I've ever worked on, is in Secret Bay, Dominica. And this was another project where, again, I was kind of just put on a plane and sent over and said, you know, just make it happen. <laughs> so Secret Bay Dominica is a beautiful site. Um, there are some existing kind of architectural pavilions dotted across the landscape. And there you see some, some really gorgeous images. Um, kind of the most beautiful vista of the site is that it overlooks um, Fort Shirley across the bay. So it's a gorgeous sweeping site, very untouched, very exclusive. Um, so you could imagine that whatever interventions we did on this site would need to kind of carry that kind of respect for nature throughout. But everyone knows in the Caribbean, we have to deal with hurricanes. And as beautiful as this site was, it could not stand up obviously to the devastation of Hurricane Maria in 2017. So I was still in St. Kitts when um, the hurricane passed. And then shortly after, I had to head over to Dominica um, to take a look at this, um, this facility. And I remember flying in on the plane, one, it was a little bumpy, but two, across the entire hillside, it looked like somebody had literally just like stripped all the leaves off the trees. And I don't know if any of you cook, but you know, like when you strip the time off the sprig, you just like pull it and everything come off. That's how it looked like somebody just pull all the leaves off and just push down all of the trees. It was absolute devastation. So the images to the right there are some of the, the buildings on this particular site that we were asked to kind of rebuild. Um, they were originally residential villas, but the owner really wanted to provide more of an amenity space for the area. So he wanted to have an open air restaurant, right? So having suffered all of that devastation, I can't stress how critical it was to build better, 
right? To be able to kind of offer a solution that tick the boxes in terms of the program that they wanted to incorporate, but also to, to give a sense of comfort through the design that this building can stand up, okay? So the larger building to the bottom there would become the open air restaurant and the top image is taken from the, the deck of what would become a spa pavilion. I'd say working for a developer is a little different to working for an architect or within an architect's office. A lot of my time is obviously spent on site, but not that there is no respect for the process or stages, it's just that often there's not enough time. You know, a developer or a, a property owner, they kind of want a quick solution. They often want to get back onto market so that they can, you know, make an income, make money. So there's not often time to go back to the office and sit down and do, you know, like a really in-depth conceptual analysis or site analysis of the site. Oftentimes they know the site much better than me. Um, and they kind of tell me what they want. We, we do our site visit, we walk around, we get a sense of the site, we verify, you know, wind, sun, et cetera, but then it's really giving them what they want. So a lot of times it's literally sketching on the back of a napkin on the airplane, sending a photo when you land, figuring it out on the flight. And I think that has been honestly the defining motif of my career. I don't have a lot of time to get super precious about things. So it means that I have to get really creative and talk back a little bit sometimes to make sure that um, what I think are the, the ideals of the project make their way to the end. Um, so those are just some really quick sketches that, that I did following the conversations with the, with the owner. And then on the right, very quickly, we go from kind of sketch layouts into not finished drawings, but more evocative evocative drawings so that they can get a sense of the vibe and the spirit that we're trying to capture. Um, the sketches on the left there are sketches that we did for the spa pavilion itself. So as you can see, very light footprint, nothing you know, too extra or, or trying to be iconic or a flagship facility, but just something that was had a sense of bunker, a, a sense of safety closability from nature while still being quite open and allowing the landscape to do whatever it was doing below. And then very quickly you get into simple renders. Um, the beauty of this building was never about what it looked like from the outside. It was about fitting in with the landscape, disappearing into the bush basically, simply put. It was not about trying to be an icon or anything like that. It was just about framing nature and allowing people to integrate with nature. Um, and then obviously that meant we had to go inside. So very quickly again, just super quick sketches, sketch up, um, a bit of Lumion, nothing crazy, but what was important here is to capture the sense of lighting, the sense of approach and progression through the building, to capture that appeal, what does it feel like at night? What does it feel like when the sun is setting? Um, what's the ambiance of the space? Is there a display kitchen where the activity of the chef and these small plates that they're making becomes the experience in itself, you know? So really trying to communicate to the owner and sell them on, on the idea of what this space could be. And then this is an example of the final, final interior design. Um, Eventually we work our way up to, you know, more typical construction drawings just for contractors to execute. But a lot of it was, like I said, just about capturing the ambience of the space, careful selections of FF and E, um, just really careful selection and appointment of finishes, fixtures, and just letting the beauty of the surroundings do a lot of the work for us. What you see at the top there is actually a canvas awning that's zippable and demountable um, during hurricanes. And that central core that you see there actually remains open through the through adverse weather. So it's kind of counterintuitive, but I'm really I'm really keen on this idea of accepting the fact that we live with um, adverse weather. And I don't believe that our buildings in the Caribbean should shut themselves off from nature. I think we need to allow it to come through, acknowledge its presence, and lock ourselves off where we can, but allow it to pass through. So the bar area that you're seeing there is actually a lockable bunker zone 
So if there's a hurricane coming, for example, the owners can pack up all the furniture and put it into that space and lock that zone, demount the canvas, but then the wind is free to kind of flow through the, through the structure basically. So it has less of a chance of building up pressure on the facade and it tends to perform a little bit better, well, a lot better in rooms. Yeah, and I mean, simple details, I think, make and break a building. This is one of the remnants of the original design by a Venezuelan architect, I believe. And that simple cross bracing, we were very adamant about keeping that and creating these um, cantilever dining opportunities so that, like I said, is not about the building kind of carving off space from the environment, but kind of projecting and forcing people to be confronted, um, you know, by the tree canopy around. And this is a view of the, from within the Gomier Spa Pavilion. Um, the same kind of approach, if you look at the plan on the top left there, that kind of sacrificial central core idea remains and the changing room and the shower become those lockable zones. So whatever um, massage tables, um, garbage bins, plants or pottery, you can actually pull those into those locker zones and the entire building remains open with louvered windows and it allows the, the wind to disperse as it flows through the building. So there's less chance of it again, kind of breaking up um, the facade elements are kind of knocking the building over. And where we did have to create enclosed facades, we did so um, with our thinking caps on. So I think all of us in the Caribbean know about louvered windows, you know, in Barbados, you know, we have shuttle houses and when, when the wind get too strong, you kind of open the louvers and it will let the wind flow through. Um, similar idea here. We want to be able to allow light to come in, but we don't want to kind of close off the windows. We don't want to leave large expanses of glass for like um, wind, wind projected missiles from like a coconut or something. So is there a clever way to detail the building in such a way that you preserve the kind of beauty of the timber, um, that's evident throughout the, the context of the other villas, but do it in a, in a more clever way where you just have the simple hit or miss um, timber fin detail going across the facade acting as a protective screen, but still allowing you to get beautiful glimpses through the building at nighttime. And probably one of my most favorite moments um, about this project is just the willingness to kind of adopt that attitude of resilience and rebuild from stuff that was fallen. So obviously a lot of the trees that were felled, we simply just reused them. They became either benches or the whole staff station that you could see there. Um, the, the, the Rasta man on site would just come and you would point and you would stand there with them and figure out how you wanna shape this. And you know elements that we use throughout the building were then taken from elements that were lost during the hurricane. Um, and then I wanna finish by talking a bit about some of the recent work that I'm doing. Um, I've spoken to you about kind of ethereal projects, um, kind of boutique hotel projects, um, but also urban intervention. Um, it's quite easy to, not easy, but it's a different beast to be designing something for luxury or an amenity space. So then how do you serve more urban spaces? So this is a project that I worked on with a landscape designer here in Barbados, Tama Mill Studio. And it's part of the Bridgetown Transformation Project. So in Bridgetown, it's quite densely populated. On that map there to the right, you can see um, some of the green spaces throughout the city and on the outskirts of the city. Um, but I think the map is a bit generous because as you can see from the photo to the left, green spaces on a map don't equate to green spaces in a cityscape. Right? There's often a lack of connectivity. So part of this project is about trying to connect the dots basically. Um, the old NIS building in Barbados um, was demolished and then we had this empty spot that we wanted to transform into Golden Square Freedom Park. So that's just a rough master plan of the site on the left there. Um, essentially, we ended up just doing a broadscape, um, some softscaping, some hardscaping, permeable hardscaping, um, some sports courts. So we had some little tennis courts, um, some shade pavilions with some bench seating under. We retrofitted the some of the fire towers on site to be able to have plasma screens so there could be projections being played at night. 
And it was really about creating a space within the city for respite. I think we oftentimes think that green space needs to be, you know, a lush botanical garden or something like that. Oftentimes it just needs to be a place of respite, a place within the business of the city that you can step into and have a moment of calm. And this is an overview of, of the project finished. Um, it was opened um, last year and it was such a joy to be able to see people just using the site. That big um, circular track that you see there is a jogging track basically. And in the middle there, you have these shade pavilions, these very, very tall, almost double story um, structures that just offer a place for people to come during the day or at night to just you know sit down, have a bite to eat, um, offer opportunities for events. It's basically a plug and play system where you know, dancers, artists, they can come and just hook up and be able to, you know, host their events within the heart of the city. So I mentioned connecting the dots and some of those other opportunities across um, the cityscape start to pop up, not just in demolished buildings, but buildings that are no longer fit for certain uses. Um, and then obviously existing park spaces that aren't quite um, properly explored or developed um, and they're very much underused. So how do we start to connect these spaces? And this is a very interesting, interesting um, bird's eye view because this shows the intended developments of Bridgetown and Carlisle Bay and um, areas across the city in Barbados that are potentially out for tender at the moment. And as you can see, a lot of attention is given obviously to the coast where we are trying to trying to implement kind of either condos, hotels, high rises, and kind of develop um, the tourism market for, for this kind of development. Um, but what about the inner, inner parts of the city, right? So how do we start to take that kind of greenery and that kind of attention and push it a bit more inland, you know? So this next project that I'll quickly go through, if you can go to the next slide, starts to speak towards that, where we start to question, how do we make an identity for Barbados? We don't have per se a town square, um, we have some parliament buildings, but there's no real sense of place making um, that you step into in Bridgetown and feel like, okay, this is the hearts of Barbados. So this intervention is very theoretical, um, an adaptive reuse project Basically, the remit was to come up with an idea of how we can change the facade of the building and create a space for Bajans to kind of use, um, to reinvigorate the cityscape and start to bring some economic activity back into to Barbados. And I kind of call this the industrium because, you know, in our collaborative sessions and our design charades, the idea was very much of, about how do we bring the heart of industry back to Bridgetown. So this project was, was done from concept to the images that you see here in maybe um, a weekend, no joke. Like I said, we don't often have a lot of time to dive deep and, and kind of go through all of the, what you would expect to be the design analysis and cultural context. Sometimes you have one meeting to kind of capture high level interest to be able to get funding for a project. So you don't often have a lot of time, but you kind of need to condense all of that design thinking and, and that want for better um, into evocative images to at least get a seat at the table to have the conversation. So part of this, the idea for this project was to create a ramped bridge up from the cityscape because obviously, Bridge Tongue is very traffic heavy. A lot of the development is going towards the coast. So a lot of the traffic is gonna to increase to be able to serve those buildings. So what do we do with the streetscape of the buildings that aren't kind of involved in that development? So the thinking is we want to raise them. We want to raise the streetscape. And if you go to the next image, Jordan, we almost sacrifice the fact that the street level is for cars. So a lot of these buildings on the lower level are maybe I wanna say 13 feet high. So that's almost perfect for 
a car elevator basically to be able to have um, more cars within a tighter footprint. So if you rather than have a car park structure, you decide, for example, that all of these underused buildings that are not you know, not occupied at the moment. What if rather than trying to find parking elsewhere in the city, which is a huge problem, what if we just acknowledge that we use that ground floor for that? And if you go to the next slide, Jordan, there are simple proprietary systems out there that already do much of what we're trying to do, you know, in a lot of our urban scapes. We're 166 square miles wide. We don't have a lot of space. So I think going higher has its benefits, but you also want to condense the footprint of the building and that includes cars, that includes services, that includes everything it needs to make this building function. You kind of want to pull it within the footprint of the building. And I think simple solutions like this are at least exploring them as a possibility would start to open up the ways in which we design, you know, urban buildings moving forward. And what that allows us to do is then you kind of create this ramp up into the new streetscape, which is removed from the pollution, removed from the noise of that kind of urban level. And you create these exciting spaces that become the new marketplaces of the city. So imagine these bridged elements throughout the city where you elevate that economic activity and kind of create this corridor of sorts that connects these underused spaces and these underused buildings through these green corridors that take you into say a new cafe or your food and veg market or this food emporium where you can get like local infused foods and, and crafts and stuff like that. And then thinking about what if our buildings are not just used for housing in the city as seems to be the direction that we're hoping to go. What if there are opportunities, like I said, for economic activity, for showcasing art, for, for integrating our culture within the actual fabric of the, build, the building so that our facade is not just you know, a facade, but it deals with um, solar shade, maybe it harvests rainwater, maybe it doubles as some kind of kinetic um, local art installation. There are opportunities to see buildings as not just you know, homes or shelter. There are opportunities to kind of integrate themselves with the cultural landscape of, of the society as well. And then obviously co-working spaces or as I like to call them co-creating spaces where the city is not just about purchasing, but is about creating. So imagine if in the central location, you know, you just catch one bus, you get into town and you just have these amazing facilities where you can jump on a call like this, listen into a lecture, watch a, a movie, um, develop an app. You know, what can we do for our cities if we create spaces like this for people to enjoy? And same thing here, just exploring on the ideas that the city now is not just about trade. It, it shouldn't be 100% about um, residential development either. There needs to be that mixed use sweet spot where you get these different levels of, of, of program, this different level of engagement from tourists, yes, but also from locals. And then to keep everybody happy, you could get your money back on the accommodation on the top floor. But I think as a society and what this project is starting to explore is how do we get away from that traditional um, tourism model where we kind of lean towards tourism as the only solution and start to think of how we can integrate um, trade, economic activity, um, local production um, into the, the fabric of tourism to create spaces that don't just serve outside of our region, but serve us as well. And I think that is it, yeah. Thank you so much guys for listening and I'm gonna open the questions now. I'm sure there's some already in the chat. I see one question from Jacinthia. Let me hear you, Jacinthia. Hi, Alyssa. Yes. So, uh, a lot of the projects that you mentioned uh, are um, the clients are has deep pockets, and we have the landscape and all of that to support the design. But the reality is sometimes is, especially as young architects coming up, we don't always get that luxury. It's often persons in our community and stuff who know it's okay, you could do a little design, 
I have a piece of land and I want you to design a home for me. And there is a tight budget always associated with that. How do you incorporate um, uh, staying within budget, uh, beautiful design, functionality, and also dealing with a client that doesn't have the design intellect to understand that a building can be beautiful and doesn't cost you a lot of money. Thank you, Cynthia. I want to ask you back a question. Well, Mike, you think my clients got deep pockets? Well, baby girl. And I think that's a compliment of the quality of the work. <laughs> yes, um, I, will, I will say this. I will say this. And that's a really great point. But I don't, I don't want to accept for the part kayak projects. Say, for example, Secret Bay, this is, this is a client that just suffered major loss, right? We're not building with a big budget. Um, and I think that project definitely taught me that we're reusing stuff that fell on the ground, basically. You know, we're, we're, we're not looking for expensive hurricane shutters, but we're thinking, okay, what do we do traditionally that we can kind of tweak and use in this design? The timber that we use to cover the windows, for example, doesn't cost any more than the timber that we use, you know, to close the facade, right? So I think oftentimes the solution there is to get creative. In this field, we're all creative, you know, by assumption, but it's kind of exploring and, and be willing to kind of test ideas. It's not always about the budget because you can have a million dollar budget and the project gonna be $2 million and it's still a problem, right? Your budget could be $5 and $10 is a problem, right? So you kind of have to think um, creatively and laterally, what do we have that we've been doing that can solve this problem, right? And that's not to say that sometimes, like you rightfully said, your client doesn't always have a lot of money, but I think that's the beauty of architecture. It's not just about being as creative as you can with no regard for money or how long it might take to build something or the logistics of even getting things to, 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 to an island, you know? In, in the region, logistics is a huge problem for us. So for me, I look at it from the point of view that this is another constraint. You know, if you were on a tight site, you would you would be respectful of the context. You'd be respectful of, you know, wind, sun, all of these other things. I think finances is just another constraint that you have to integrate into the design and respond accordingly. Um, we have a question from Bonito. Mm -hmm. um, hi, everyone. Um, so you mentioned in your presentation, Alyssa, that the developers often rush the design phases due to, you know, the whole time equals profit scenario. How damaging do you think this is to today's architecture and how the public values architecture in terms of the aesthetics? Um, and how have we allowed those with money and power to kind of diminish the importance of our work as architects and trample on our purpose? And do you sometimes feel guilty that you're somewhat contributing to that kind of um, situation? <laughs> Y'all laughing, right? But I, the last part of the question, I'll challenge you to ask me that in about two weeks, and then you'll know why. Um, okay. <laughs> hold me to that. But um, I think everywhere you look in the Caribbean, there is development, hospitality-related development. Oftentimes, and I've learned this firsthand, is an extra-regional company does come in. They have a vision for what they want to execute. Um, oftentimes, to much criticism, it can be exclusive of, you know, the neighboring communities, etc. I think yes, potentially it is a problem. I, I won't, I won't back away from that. I think a lot of the projects that I have kind of tucked under my wing and carried through are the smaller ones, like the one I showed you, where there's a little more consideration to what this piece of architecture is. Um, I think working from a development point of view has kind of opened my eyes to kind of realities of design life. Um, you know, in school, you're kind of free to explore, you know, as you wish, but then you butt up on your first project and, you know, it's focused, this is what we're doing. You don't veer too far left, you don't veer too far right. You kind of just execute on the task. And I do think 
you know, and even talking to colleagues, I do think is a challenge for us in the Caribbean because we are so dependent on tourism. We are so driven by, you know, these kind of developments, providing jobs, providing opportunities that we almost kind of rely on them. And you see that even in the citizenship by investment programs where persons come in and they're able to buy lands, for example, you know, for exchange of money. Um, and I think that is just a remnants of a very troubled past where, you know, we're kind of grasping to understand what do we value most? Do we value the financial gain or do we value the quality of life or the kind of the, the kind of importance of zoning, for example? So I, I do think it's a challenge, I'm not gonna lie. And I think is 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 a is one of the frustrations that I have faced, you know, throughout my career. But I think I've, I always tell people when when you get a chance to sit at the table where these um, decisions are being made, hijack the meeting, like talk. <laughs> Say, so, um, but anybody thought it is like, you know, it's a const it's a constant battle. I'm not gonna lie, it, it is challenging, especially from you know, like I shared in my early career, my my kind of approach to design and life in general is kind of a little left field, um, not terribly profit minded. Um, so yeah, it's a constant challenge. Thank you for answering. You're welcome. Um, I'll jump into the chat, questions in the chat. Yeah. Um, how do you advocate for the strongest level of building resilience in your private versus public project? Yeah, so I like to make a business case. Oftentimes people don't respond to, and this is not a, a criticism of anyone I've ever worked with, but I think in general, people, everyone has their personal agenda. You don't know what their, their bottom line is some people's pe some people just have a single bottom line and it's profit other people might have a triple bottom line and it's people planet and profit where they want to see benefits across those three aspects so i find quite honestly everyone responds to money if you can sell a client on what makes financial sense and it has added benefits they're going to listen to you even even the most challenging clients if they you know, if they say, I don't care anything about sustainability, I don't care if it's helping the community, I don't care, I just want something that makes money. If you sell them on the incentives and the market value of integrating these principles, they're, they're gonna listen, right? So I think is is about doing the due diligence of going through whether it's um, environmental impact assessments, whether it's social impact assessments, whether it's just, having your own design intent that you think, okay, within this context, this design approach makes sense. I think, yes, you hold on to that very deeply, but you also have to think as a business person, as an architect, from a financial point of view. And if you can make those cases and, and kind of showcase that incentive as well, people, people listen. It might not be the most beautiful story of how you got to that point, but the goal is to get to that point. Great. Um, I another more of a comment than a question in the comments. Um, before we get into Dorian's question, um, Shani Gibson. She says she's at work, so she can't unmute. Um, she says, "I think this design goes beyond what we as Bayesians know as regular. Many of our buildings don't go far beyond the functionality aspect of this. Hence, we don't really appreciate the form unless we're educated in that specific field." Yeah. And you know, I just want to piggyback on it and ask this question specifically about the park project. I'm curious about the background behind it because there's design of buildings, but I think in the region. Is it just me or is Jordan stuck? I think I think he's frozen. But I think basically <laughs> I'm assuming his question was kind of about the process of, of, of designing a public space, given that generally architects aren't um, designing something that is completely one, not profit driven at all, but it's completely for public space. And also to add to that, you had mentioned that you had done design charrettes for the park. 
I'd love to hear a little bit about that process and how you, en yeah. you engage community in the design. Yeah. So the lead designer on this project was actually the landscape designer. Um, and I must admit this project came very much top down. So this was um, kind of championed by the prime minister really. Um, as I mentioned to you, we don't really have a lot of park space, used park space in, in Bridgetown. And the area previously would have been known as Golden Square Freedom Park, where Clement Payne, um, one of our national heroes, was said to have, um, he gave his lectures um, from that area. So it held a lot of cultural significance. And I think I think everyone in the room probably knows Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley and her vision and her passion for, you know, kind of put, putting Barbados um, to the forefront of the global world. So I think this was very much on the agenda to have a space that kind of celebrated Barbadiana, celebrated culture. So in this particular instance, it was a very much top down um, driven approach. When it comes to engagement with the community, um, a lot of the design charades would have been obviously with engineering teams and the landscapers and persons like myself, um, but with artists trying to think of how we can not just use the park as an opportunity to temporarily showcase um, design, but to create spaces where constantly um, you know, artists and installations and interventions can infiltrate the space and kind of make it their own. So a lot of the, the intervention is about, again, just, just creating that canvas, creating that canvas for the community to be able to use the space, push and pull, um, decide who's gonna paint this bench um, this month, who's gonna be installing their new kinetic artwork, um, for public display this month and kind of keep the the activity very communal thank you i see bonita's hand up um yes i just wanted to add um something because you the way you answered the question a while ago it kind of took me back to my previous question of like do we should we get poly like involved in politics like do politicians have the power to play a kind of a role in solving that issue that we were talking about earlier. Um, I know oftentimes architects are kind of scared to get political because it's bad for business, but maybe it's time we get political and come together and try and solve some of these issues instead of like expecting them to be solved on our own. And I understand like the, how it is in the real world. And when you're in school, it's very easy to be idealistic and naive, which is probably how I sound, but I just wanted to know your thoughts on that. I, I would probably characterize myself as idealistic. And, and quite frankly, I'll be very honest with you. I'm, I'm very sure that I come across naive until you have a conversation with me. And I, I wouldn't say that is because I'm a woman or whatever. Um, I think I'm a very chill individual and disarmingly so. Um, so when I go into a meeting spit and fire, you know, Usually people then sit down and be like, okay, we are a meeting, yes. But I, I agree with you though. Um, I think, and I'm speaking candidly, I think architects have this um, stereotype of being pretentious, right? And if you, if you kind of take that stereotype on board, you stop fighting for the things that you know make sense, right? Somebody might value money over the fact that you have to relocate, you know, a bunch of citizens from their neighborhood to be able to build something. And it might not make financial sense, but it makes communal sense or community sense or life, lifestyle impact sense, you know? And I think oftentimes as designers, you find yourselves fighting for or arguing, um, the kind of underdog case, right? And I don't think there's anything to shy away from in that because as designers, you, you are you are a chaperone of sorts, right? Whether it's for your client or public good or whatever, you're kind of the champion and chaperone walking people through the process, process of how to get the best out of this space, right? If you can be objective about it, and, and that's why I'm so adamant about the fact that as architects, we kind of need to educate ourselves on, on being in a business setting. Because yes, school, um, 
coming from the artistic side, you can be perceived as, as naive because oftentimes you're the, you, you may be the only one that is kind of pinpointing laser focus on this one thing that may not be the most dramatic issue for everybody else, but does it's kind of your role, I feel, to kind of take that on board and constantly present it as an issue, right? It's not just about, about the ROA, it's not just about you know the how quickly you can get a return on investment. It's not just about how much the construction materials cost and can we do it cheaper, you know? It, it might simply be about the fact that this is not a low VOC finish and we are not putting it on the internal walls of this building because people gonna get cancer. You know what I mean? And, and that's just a really simple example, but it could be something even more discreet. It might be that is a particular type of finish that doesn't have any um, like documented harmful issues, but maybe it was used somewhere before and, and there were documented problems that you know of in doing your research. And yes, legally it might be acceptable, but do you step up and say, hang on guys, this could potentially be a problem, right? It's very, it's, it's quick to get a building up. It's quick to get a building airtight, watertight, um, commission it, hand it over, get people in it, right? But what are the little things? What 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 is it actually like to occupy the building after you've kind of dusted your hands and walked away from the project? I will never ever ever forget the first lecture I had in architecture. They gave us a story about um, an architect that designed. I think it was a hospital or something like that, right? And eventually, over time, people were getting Legionnaires' disease, and they ended up suing the architects because they said. It was the architect's job to create the maintenance schedule to tell people how often to service things, right? You have such a deep responsibility sometimes as a designer to kind of get the little things right. And because it seems like such a little thing and everyone's in a rush to get to the finish line that you know, it, it might, you know, it might slide or it might not be deemed as important or something you could worry about later. Sometimes that's just, you can't worry about some things later. Sometimes everybody got to stop, listen to the annoying architect in the room that's constantly bringing up this point and address it then and there because some of those problems compounds. So it's about accepting that as architects have a wider responsibility on the social like platform, like on a social level. Um, I just wanted to ask if anybody else had any more questions. Hey, I, I have a question. Hi, it's interesting. It's interesting you mentioned maintenance of a building. I think um, sometimes people get the design and uh, they pay the architect the monies and they don't think about how am I going to uh, maintain this building, especially when they're specialist design. So how can architects um, be involved in um, maintaining a building over time without it being task tasking and taxing on them? So is there a follow-up in a, a year or two years? Do you think that's necessary? What's your advice? What's your take on it? I think what is a good rule of thumb is to have an operations and maintenance manual. Um, Handover is important, but see that operations and maintenance manual where you have a documentation of every finish in the building, every specification. Usually in that document, you'll tell people um, how to clean things, how things need to be serviced, what, what to and what not to do in maintaining the building. And I think, honestly, what I found is the biggest um, solution to this issue is communicate with your client. It's not you designing the building, it's a collective effort, right? If you have an issue with something that they've chosen or, or they have an issue with something you've chosen, discuss it. What are the pros and cons? Everybody needs to be able to sign off on the selections and have it documented so that we can all come back at a later date and say, well, yeah, we did all kind of agree on this, but maybe it's not performing. Why is it not performing? Have we been using the correct materials? Have we been servicing it as it should? Um, is there some new issue where the building in front of us get knocked down and we're right by the beach and all of a sudden we got more sea spray and now the paint on the building is performing different? It's about communication and questioning. 
I think to solve that problem is to keep the, the clients involved throughout the process. And that goes back to what I was saying to Doreen, see that design charade, that communication, that, that open communication is so critical for successful projects. A lot of times we kind of hide away, you know, late night, like struggling away on, on drawings and, you know, just sending them off and be like, oh gosh, okay, that's done. It's about the back and forth. Right? Nothing's ever perfect. Like we all human. And in this profession, we try so hard to be perfect. <laughs> like it's almost like a past the blame game. That's not the way I enjoy designing. And God willing, when I start my own firm, we go everything will be on the table. Because I think that's where we get into this past the book mentality, where it's not my scope of work, it's not my issue, is the engineer's issue. But all you're all designing the building though. And the goal is to get a building that you can deliver to your client that you're satisfied works. So that constant communication is so, so important. Um, Stacy. Uh, yes, Stacy has her hands up. Stacy, would you like to go ahead? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, first of all, for having this session. I'm sorry that I joined late, but I hope there's a recording that comes out because, you know, as you say, these emergencies happen. I'm really glad uh, or encouraged by the discussion that you're having, and particularly the ones that relate to when the building is done, um, because we live in, we, we all want to do such great work, and I feel like we just live in such a litigious world these days um, because, um, and, and the book that you talk about handing over the operations maintenance manual is so critical. Um, it's a lot of work and I don't think that we get paid fairly for it, but it's a lot of work just to avoid situations. Yeah, I was in a similar situation. Um, we had an air conditioning closet in a building. And of course they used the air conditioning closet to store janitorial materials when they ran out of space. The intake on the unit, it's a stand-up unit, the intake on the unit was at the bottom and because it was raised off the floor, the janitorial people put bleach and all these other kind of chemical things underneath. And so those chemicals were being sucked up through the air conditioning going out through the building. And, you know, of course we had to hire lawyers and all that and in the end we won, but man, had I had a manual, I would have saved yeah. myself a lot of money and a lot of time. Yeah, Doc documentation saves you headaches down the road. It, it definitely does. And, and by the way, bleach and ammonia together is a disaster, by the way. So cleaning, cleaning supplies is, you know, does a health, major, major health issue in it. Well, it voided the unit on the warrant, the warranty on the unit. Yeah. And then there was the effects of the occupants of the building. Yeah. And then it all came back to Stacy. Well, call the architect, call the architect, call the architect, call the architect. You know, with, and, and of course we figured that if we handed over the maintenance manual for the machine, that that would suffice. But no, it was a physical, it was at a university, it was a department, people change, you know, just kind of the whole paper trail thing. But no, that was a very good suggestion. Thanks. And I, I think too, um, you know, even in Barbados, we're starting to move towards, um, in our energy policy, for example, we kind of look towards like accreditations, like LEED um, for kind of like a benchmark for performance. And I think in the, in the Caribbean, I find people are enthusiastic about it, but they don't always follow through. But at the very least, I kind of use those guidelines, whether it be lead or even well, for example, to get a well accreditation, you can't store certain chemicals together at all even um, because it's a potential health risk, you know? So I find kind of, even as a not working in an architectural office per se, I kind of use best practice or those guidelines as benchmarks to help me just design a better building. Right? And then I use those to kind of formulate the documentation, not just to protect me, but to make sure the building is, is being used you know, correctly. Because quite frankly, left to their own devices, even some owners would, you know, after the electrical inspection, they're gonna go and turn the electricity, the room into like a storage or something because you know, they could make something off of it or use it, use it for something else. So 
a lot of times, like I said, you kind of have to be a champion, but a chaperone as well, and kind of guide people through the process of what's best practice and how to get the best use out of, you know, a building. All right. Um, so seeing that we have um, no more questions, we kind of want to wrap things up. So we just want to say thank you so much to our guest speaker. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, and we also want to say thank you to Island City Lab and the Caribbean School of Architectures Association, which is CASA. Um, so yeah, I see someone in the chat says this is an awesome session. Thank you. You're welcome. And the recording will be available on YouTube on the Island City Labs YouTube page. And on that page, you can also find the Emerging Practice Series, which was done last semester. There's about three more architects uh, with that one. So yeah, thank you guys so much for coming out. I'm gonna hand over to Dorian Duncan. If she has any um, announcements or things that she'd like to say. No, I think you did a really good job of closing us out, Bonita. But thank you again, Alyssa. I think, you know, words of wisdom um, honest words of advice that we all appreciate your vulnerability and your honesty. Um, so thank you so much. And um, yeah, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. And say hi to Jordan. He didn't come back. So <laughs> his internet just disappeared. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you so much, guys. And I'm really looking forward to seeing, you know, what other discourse you guys generate. So yeah. More, more in the pipeline. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.